Support for UWTV is provided by the Boeing Employees Credit Union. The simplest, most perfect way to entertain ourselves is just to look around. The world is full of beautiful things waiting to be enjoyed. Our eyes are busy every day, all the time, providing us with both pleasure and essential information. So when something threatens our ability to see, it can be devastating. My mother would come home from the visit to the ophthalmologist and I'd say, what did he say? And she'd say, he said to get in touch with the Association for the Blind. And I'd say, but you're not blind. And she'd say, well, that's all he could say. There was nothing that could be done. Ann Beidler's mother had macular degeneration. So did her grandmother and her two aunts. I was very close to all of them. So I was very much part of their lives. And I watched with horror as they incrementally lost bit by bit of their sight. Years later, Anne began to notice problems with her own vision. The first change was that straight lines began to look wavy. Wherever I would look and there was a straight line, you know, like along a window or along a computer screen, a little window in a computer screen, or the edge of a table or the stripe in the rug, those would all be wiggly, wavy, all of a sudden. And I knew they weren't wavy. Over time, Anne began to feel that she was looking at the world through bits of debris. We used to have a screened-in porch in Pennsylvania, and, you know, sometimes leaves and bits of dirt get clogged up, and it's sort of like looking through that. So you'd look around, and I was moving my head a lot, trying to find a place where I could see through clearly. A retired drug and alcohol counselor turned writer, Anne began to realize that she wouldn't be able to work at her computer much longer. Watching television, driving a car, and many other details of life were becoming difficult. She had to think about ways to accomplish even basic tasks. I used to work at the soup kitchen, and I would chop all morning, you know, chop vegetables. And this was really hard. I was craning my neck and never getting it right and not sure. And I thought, here I am thinking about these routine little things. This is terrible. Anne had joined the ranks of the almost two million Americans living with age-related macular degeneration. We have a large number of patients, the baby boomers, that are beginning to retire and they're reaching the age where they're really at higher risk for this disease. And so there's a very interesting metric that the idea being that in the not too distant future, maybe 10 years or so, the number of patients that have severe vision changes from this disease may be more like three million. Basically, macular degeneration means that part of the retina stops functioning. The degeneration can occur in one or both eyes. The eye is very much like a camera, and that's what I tell my patients. We're going to open this model up here. And really, light comes in through the front end and uh, is focused by the cornea and the lens and forms an image on the back surface, which is the retina, which is an incredibly complicated, delicate tissue, about the thickness of a piece of tissue paper. Uh, within that tissue paper are about 10 layers of cells that are an incredibly intricate network. Uh, that can extract information to rival any, any digital sensor that anyone has ever come up with. It's an, a remarkable tissue. And it uh, transduces light into electrical signals which go out the optic nerve to our brain and that's how we see. The macula is the part of the retina that gives us our central vision. When it deteriorates, the center of what we see is blurred while peripheral vision remains clear. The loss of central vision can be very frustrating because what happens is that you may pick something up with your side vision, but then the moment you look at it, it's gone. I remember my mother, well, relatives would sit around and my uncle would say, she says she can't see, but you know what? She reached down and picked up a piece of thread off the floor. Now she can see, she's just pretending. Well, it wasn't that, it wasn't that at all but it is very difficult for other people to understand. 
And this is a color picture of the right eye. Um, what it shows are the, the drusen, and these are these yellow spots. And it also has these pigmentary changes, again, very common for dry macular degeneration. There are two kinds of macular degeneration. One is called dry, and the other is wet. Dry is the most common, comprising about 90% of cases. This dry form develops as the tissue in the macula ages and thins. That deterioration is related to the formation of small deposits called drusen. Often it's a little bit of cholesterol, a little bit of cellular byproducts, uh, and basically that's what happens is that with macular degeneration, the cells that help uh, to uh, support the retina begin to have trouble keeping up with the metabolic demands. And so these byproducts build up and they get deposited under the retina. Uh, and that can cause damage to the underlying structure of the retina. Okay, I want you to blink a couple of times. The deterioration progresses slowly and people may not notice it for years. That's especially true if only one eye is affected. For those who develop the wet type, which is a vascular condition, changes in vision are more sudden and more serious. What happens is that you get bleeding, and bleeding happens suddenly. You can get leaking fluid through abnormal blood vessels, which can also cause a change in the architecture of the retina, which causes a change in vision. Okay, again, real wide. Good. Excellent. Anne started with dry macular degeneration, which progressed to wet in her left eye. The sudden change terrified her because there had been no treatment available for her mother. Fortunately for Anne, things have changed. Prior to about 2006, uh, the treatments that were FDA approved for macular degeneration really uh, did not reverse the disease, they just slowed it down somewhat. Uh, in 2006, a drug was approved uh, for the first time that actually reverses some of the damage and can leave people seeing better than when they walked in the office. And for us, that's extremely exciting uh, because for the first time, we can really offer hope to these patients when they walk in that they will be seeing better uh, if. Uh, and when they finish their, their treatment course with us. The treatment involves injections that target a protein called vascular endothelial growth and permeability factor. The revolution was really in understanding more about this molecule, vascular endothelial growth and permeability factor, or VEGF. VEGF stimulates the growth of new blood vessels, which can sometimes contribute to forming abnormal blood vessels in the eye, leading to macular degeneration. To mitigate that process, an antibody for VEGF is injected. Drops numb the eye first. In that first interaction, when you tell a patient, you know, what I recommend is a small needle in the eye, patients really don't like the idea of anything going into their eye. And the first thing they always ask is, well, do I have to be awake for this? And, and then after they have the, the medicine injected, they think, well, was that all it was? Is, or, or when are you going to do the injection? So sometimes they don't even feel it. So we go in with a very small needle in the front of the eye so that we can deliver the medicine into the posterior chamber. And it stays there for several weeks, which allows that medicine to slowly diffuse to the retina, which is this thin layer that you see the blood vessels in. And that's where it goes. So it basically diffuses to the back of the eye and gets to the problem. Hi, how are you doing? Shortly after Anne learned that she had progressed to the wet form of the disease, her husband Peter needed emergency retinal surgery with Dr. Atma Vemalakanda at the UW Medicine Eye Institute. During Peter's follow-up visit, Anne asked about injections for her macular degeneration. And he got out the eye, you know, the model of the eye, and he showed me where the injection is, explained what the, the drug that they inject does, and uh, I said, by the way, do you do these? And he said, yes, I do them. And this is your left eye. Anne started with a series of two injections in her left eye. The number needed varies from patient to patient. After the first injection, immediately, within hours, I could see much better. And I was so excited, because it was like somebody took a, a veil and re removed it. Well, let's have a look at you and then we'll Patients like Anne are re-evaluated several weeks after each injection until the abnormal blood vessels are no longer active. Some will require continued treatment over a longer period of time. In Anne's case, her vision improved after the first two injections. Things look great, and really, uh, your retinas look perfect. I don't see any hemorrhage, there's no fluid, uh, no lipid, nothing that makes me think that those abnormal blood vessels that we've been treating the last three months uh -huh. are active. They look like they're completely quieted down. You look great. Good. Which is what I've been hoping to tell you the last few I months. I know, that's what I was hoping to hear, <laughs> yeah. too. Anne's treatment also includes ongoing nutritional supplements, which decrease the risk of progression in both eyes. She still sees some wavy lines, but she says it doesn't matter. 
if my vision would always stay this good, I would be very grateful. It doesn't have to be perfect. <laughs> if I look at my grandson's face, you know, I can see the expression on it. You know, I can see TV, I can do the computer work, I can do kitchen work, I can read. Read just fine. He measures it by the eye test and all that, but I measure it by can I do those things? And I can. In an academic medical center with a national reputation, research and training are allies in an ongoing quest to improve patient care. New treatment for macular degeneration is just one example. Members of our department are working on even newer treatments for macular degeneration, and these include investigations in ways to reanimate the dead retina, that is, almost bring it back to life, and that includes stem cell work uh, to try to replace the cells that are lost in macular degeneration, and also chemical means to try to create new photoreceptors in the eye from cells that aren't normally photoreceptors. We also do a lot of translational work where we might do diagnostic work with a, a particular patient in the laboratory and try to figure out why uh, they're having the symptoms that they're having or the disease that they're having. But I think the larger portion of our effort is really devoted to creating large new ways to treat disease where we have none presently. And I think that's where a lot of our stem cell work is directed uh, and some of our uh, work in trying to develop therapies to prevent macular degeneration or prevent uh, myopia from occurring. As they treat patients, physicians here are also training the next generation of ophthalmologists. They teach students in the medical school, supervise residents in patient care, and provide advanced training to physicians who will be specialists. It's very important to be engaged in that training mission. It also keeps us as a, on our toes, on the faculty, because they ask very difficult questions. And it makes us think deeply about the patient's care when a resident will turn to me and say, well, why does the retina look like that in this disease? And I have to scratch my head and say, that's a great question, let's think about that. And often those will lead to research questions that we can answer right in the lab here, and that's really how the whole cycle of discovery uh, uh, goes on. And those are, those are blood vessels, they, they feed the eye? These are blood vessels, exactly. So and of course, everything comes back to treating patients. The UW Medicine Eye Institute is a multi-specialty practice with a broad range of expertise. We have 22 ophthalmologists on our staff who cover every subspecialty in ophthalmology. We have subspecialists who, who uh, specifically practice in diseases of the cornea or diseases of the retina or glaucoma or diseases of the optic nerve or my own specialty in diseases of inflammation of the eyes. We work together as a team and many of our patients see more than one of our physicians. The more complex the patient's case is and the more complex their disease is, the more likely it is that we can offer uh, care from a number of subspecialists to cover the variety of problems that they may have within their eye. That's a pretty treat. While genetics and aging affect our vision, our overall health plays a role as well. If we control our blood pressure and cholesterol, don't smoke, eat well, and wear sunglasses, we're doing a lot to protect our eyes. I've been very health conscious, actually. They're doing the right stuff, exercising. I pretty much exercise every day. Joe Fernandez pays careful attention to his health because his family history demands it. Like his father, Joe has heart trouble and diabetes. Diabetes can affect vision in a number of ways. The number one cause of blindness among working aged Americans is diabetic retinopathy. So that's where blood vessels on the retina, which is in the back of the eye, the blood vessels can either break open and bleed, they can leak fluid, but also diabetes hastens the progression of cataract. Well, let's check your vision in both eyes today, okay? Go ahead and hold this up like a mask. When there's too much sugar in the natural human lens of the eye, water flows in and creates an opacity of the lens, which is what we call a cataract. So that's a true diabetic cataract. But also independent of that, we find that age-related cataracts occur a little bit more quickly and more frequently in the setting of diabetes. Oh, you Last one. The you got to do both eyes. <laughs> and that's what happened to Joe. He first noticed vision changes while he was driving. It gradually deteriorated, and that's part of the diabetes process. You know, it, uh, unfortunately diabetes is, is, is a disease that does not get better over time. It's a, it, it degenerates basically. A cataract is a clouding of the eye's lens. The lens sits behind the iris and it helps to focus light on the retina. As we age, the lens naturally becomes cloudy and vision becomes less sharp. The severity of vision loss increases over time, and it varies from person to person. 
So everyone eventually gets cataracts. Which cataracts do we take out and which ones do we not take out? Um, it's highly variable. Um, so uh, one particular person may come the day they drop from 2020 to 20 over 25, that they have a job that's very visually intense or they have a particular attention to visual detail and they want that cataract taken out right away to improve their quality of life. Others who um, are less visually attentive or who may not be in the workforce anymore, um, their visual acuity can drop significantly without even realizing it. And occasionally I'll have to inform someone, you aren't legal to drive anymore, um, and we've got to remove these cataracts if you want to keep driving. Joe and his wife Evelyn have seen some of the world's most fascinating places. He was born in Tanzania, she in England. They've traveled to China and recently took a trip to India where they saw the Taj Mahal. I always wanted to go to India. Uh, this is basically where my parents are from, uh, from, and they're from from a part of India called Goa. Most of my pictures I took were of architecture. With more traveling planned for the future, it was important for Joe to take care of his vision problems. Due to the effects of diabetes, he was seeing a retina specialist at the UW Medicine Eye Institute, who referred him to Dr. Thelia Levesque for his cataracts. He had been being followed for mild, non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. It's the milder form of diabetes that affects the retina. And he'd had a painless, progressive loss of vision in both eyes, um, left slightly worse than right. Although when we assessed him, his acuity was actually quite low in each eye. Um, the right eye was seeing 20 over 60 and the left 20 over 80. But your eyes should be nice and numb. Looks like your lid's a little closed too, and that's exactly what we wanted, so great. Under bright lights, such as he would face in night driving, Joe's vision dropped below the limit of legal blindness. He and Dr. Levesque opted for surgery. She's very caring. So she said that, I, you know, uh, if, if I did it, I'd be very happy. And so, so we had decided to do it. Cataract surgery is one of the most commonly performed surgeries in the United States. As a general rule, risks are low and outcomes are good. Real bright light here. You okay? Yeah. Generally, the surgery is performed with minimal sedation through an IV, so the patient is awake but comfortable. Using a microscope, Dr. Levesque makes a micro-incision in the cornea, which is the clear dome on the surface of the eye. She inserts a tiny ultrasound device to soften and break up the cataract, which is then removed by suction. Some people notice a little pressure at this part. An artificial replacement called an intraocular lens is inserted. And while this is considered a very safe operation, Joe's medical history required some special attention during surgery. It's really important that we monitor his blood glucose very carefully. Also, uh, Mr. Fernandez has a history of heart problems. And um, particularly if someone of his age with a strong family history of heart disease and diabetes, um, even just walking around on the street, he has a slightly higher risk of having a cardiac event. And so during the surgery, we have um, electrodes on his chest monitoring his cardiac activity. And we're finished. Great job, Mr. Fernandez. Often, UW Medicine physicians will work as a team on complex cases. A patient comes in with real complex eye disease. Say they have a cornea problem, they have severe dry eye, they have a retina disease, they have intraocular inflammation. You have a room full of experts all under one roof at the Eye Institute and so we can consult one another, we can talk about ideas. And I think when you have a whole bunch of uh, minds working on a problem together you end up with a much better solution and that'll lead to better patient experience and patient care as well. Hi. Hi. In Joe Fernandez's case, there were no complications other than his diabetes and heart condition. His vision improved dramatically soon after surgery. So today, without any glasses, you're seeing 20-20 at distance. Um, with the left eye, perfect 20-20. Right eye, you're seeing 20-20, but you missed two letters, um, which is just still phenomenal. Cataract surgeries are performed separately on each eye, allowing time to heal in between. For a week after surgery, Joe has to cut back on exercise somewhat with no heavy lifting, and he's using some medication in his eyes. He's taking two different eye drops now. One is prednisolone acetate, which is a steroidal anti-inflammatory, and he's also taking a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, and it's specifically the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory that may act against uh, some of the diabetic retinopathy that occasionally gets worse after a cataract surgery. 
This is a big one because I really want to see Barcelona. Barcelona. Yeah. yeah. And now Joe and Evelyn are looking forward to seeing Europe with no blurriness in the picture. I really wanted him to be able to go on this trip with the best possible vision. So we timed the cataract surgery such that he would have a full recovery by the time he made his trip to Europe. Oh, sit up here. Well, that's why you, that's that's really why you dock when you go to Rome. And I'm really happy for having done it. I mean, really, my experience has been with, with, with you, Dub. They are at the front of every medical problem. Marcy Ruskin moved to the Puget Sound area almost 30 years ago when she married a native Northwesterner. First we lived on Bainbridge Island in the middle of the woods, which was really a gorgeous location. And then we lived out in Port Ludlow with a view of Mount Baker and the, and the Sound, and that was a pretty wonderful location. And then we moved here to another wonderful view. It's sort of, the view has always been a part of the houses we've had in this area. It's very nice to be in a place where you can have the windows open and enjoy what you're looking at all day and night. Health problems have never been an issue for Marcy, so when she noticed a little irritation on her eyelid, she wasn't concerned. I had what I thought was a small ingrown eyelash on my, in the corner of my eye, and it started annoying me because it, each time I would blink, I could feel it, and it continued to grow, um, but never terribly large. And when I saw my regular doctor for my physical, I said to her, can you tell me what I should do with this? And she said, yes, she wanted me to see Dr. Tower. On appearance, it looked pretty much like just a benign growth. Uh, so we scheduled her for just a routine uh, removal of the lesion and sent it off to the pathologist, which we do with uh, lumps and bumps around the eyes just to make sure that someone's looking at it underneath the microscope, giving us a definitive diagnosis. And in her case, uh, unfortunately, it did come back that it was a malignancy, a malignant eyelid tumor. Okay. In cases like Marcy's, surgeons from the Eye Institute often team with other specialists to treat patients. To treat Marcy, Dr. Tower collaborated with a dermatological surgeon who removed the cancer using Mohs surgery. This is a micrographic technique that involves checking each layer of skin microscopically as it's removed. Surgery is complete when there's no more evidence of cancer cells. The benefit of this technique is that no more tissue is removed than necessary. With the eyelid, you want to preserve as much normal tissue as possible because there's not a whole lot of extra there. And the eyelid is exquisitely important in a variety of ways. One, to the health of the eyeball itself and of course to vision and all these things, but also to the comfort and uncomfortable eyes very uh, debilitating to some people and also the way it looks because it's on your face and it's the center of attention. So we try to preserve as much normal tissue as possible. You see the bright light? Yeah. Perfect. Dr. Tower, a specialist in oculofacial reconstruction, repairs the eyelid after the cancer surgery. That may be possible on the same day, sometimes on the following day. Reconstruction may involve either a flap from the surrounding area or a graft from another area of the patient's body, depending on the size of the area to fill. In Marcy's case, Dr. Tower was able to use a flap from the skin at her temple. Initially, he prepared my right eyelid in case he needed to take some tissue from there. Turns out he didn't. The upper lid, as I recall, was about two-thirds gone and the lower lid about half and almost to my hairline on the side and through, I don't recall, I think it was about four or five hours worth of surgery, they carefully pulled it back to the point that he, he made do just with the skin that was there. And I went home with a huge black and blue eye, but nothing covering it. Um, and very quickly it healed and I have this wonderful result. We like to tell our residents, physicians that are in training, that the eyelid is more than just a flap of skin. There is probably seven layers to the eyelid that all have to be addressed and they can be grouped into two main groups of the seven layers. But you know you have the skin of course and you have the inside lining of the eyelid. But in between those two processes are uh, the muscles that open the eye, the muscles that close the eye, uh, <clears throat> some, uh, some fatty tissue to protect uh, the eye and also a barrier that uh, kind of walls off the eyelid from the eye socket. 
and so all the layers have to be um, addressed and reconstructed in the most uh, manageable way possible. Marcy remembers hearing Dr. Tower talk to her during surgery, which she found comforting. Although sedated, she liked knowing what was going on, and she's grateful for the skill that left her with only a tiny amount of scarring. You want to protect the eye, restore the function of the eyelid, and also present a very cosmetically approachable appearance. And one of the things that kind of brought me into this uh, area of medicine is uh, dealing with these delicate tissue planes and also having it be such an important part of a person's appearance, which I find to be challenging and rewarding. I wasn't concerned about my vision um, because I knew it wasn't concerning the eyeball at all, but I was certainly concerned with what my appearance would be. Um, and I never had the wildest hope that it was going to be as successful as it has been. Um, so I'm very pleased, very pleased. For more information, to make an appointment, or to refer a patient, contact the UW Medicine Eye Institute at 206-744-EYES or go to www.uwei.org or www.uwiinstitute.org.